we exalt you, Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords. And just keep playing that, Angela. I just want to speak to you fathers in this room. Great courage. Great courage over you. That the battle is in the Lord's hands. And I want you to hear him like he spoke to Joshua, like he spoke to Caleb. He said, be strong and courageous, for I am with you. I am with you. And I want you to hear that this morning. Whatever you're facing, whatever giants you're facing, whatever circumstances you're facing, highs or lows, if you're on the side of God, he is with you. Like he said to Joshua, the question is, are you on my side? And fathers in the room, he is with you. If you are on his side, he is for you. He is with you. And be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous this morning. Be strong. Lift up your heads. Even some of you fathers in the room need to look, look up. Lift up your heads. For your help comes from the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, worship team, for doing a little extra sauce there. That was fun. Who give a hand for the worship team? All right. Hey, Brian, can I get a little more uh, volume just because I'm going to bring the mic down? Just a little more volume because I'm going to bring the mic. All right. Who's excited for Romans 7? Woo! I'm excited. It's going to be a good word today. It's going to be a good word. I'm looking forward to it. Who, who is it uh, in here? It's your first time to JPC. Whoop, whoop. Keep your hand up. Was there, I saw some over here. First timers. Nice. You guys, if you go here and this is home church, make sure. Put your hands up again. Y'all are just like peeping your hand up. Keep, <laughs> keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. I want our, us to see you guys. Yes, thank you. Come say hi. It's Gage, right? He didn't put his hand back up, so I called him out. Gage is here. Come say hi to him. All right. Pull out your, your books, your Bibles. We're going to Romans 7. We're going to start in, in verse 1. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and speaking this morning. And we just yield to you. Our ears and our hearts are open. Amen. So starting here in verse 1, it's going to be up on the screen. I'm in the Passion Translation. You can follow along in your books or on the projector. I write to you, dear brothers and sisters who are familiar with the law, don't you know that when a person dies, it ends his obligation to the law? For example, a married couple is bound by the law to remain together until separated by death, right? Hence the, till death do us part. But when one spouse dies, the other is released from the law of marriage. So then, if a wife is joined to another man while still married, she commits adultery. But if her husband dies, she is obviously free from the marriage contract and may marry another man without being charged with adultery. So we can see, obviously, right, death actually ends the law over a person. Okay, that's the obvious point there being made. So, my dear brothers and sisters, the same principle applies to you and your relationship with God. For you died to your first husband, the law, by being co-crucified with the body of the Messiah. So, you are now free to marry another, the one who was raised from the dead, so that you may bear spiritual fruit for God. When we were merely living natural lives, the law, through defining sin actually awakened sinful desires within us, which resulted in bearing the fruit of death. But now we have been fully released from the power of the law. Hallelujah. And we are dead to what once controlled us. And our lives are no longer motivated. Say that, motivated. Yep, thank you to the five of you. That was, that was, that was pitiful. I like to do the, you know, get you guys to... To engage with me and, and say it after me. Um, so let's say it again. Uh, our lives are no longer motivated. 
by the, you guys are awesome, thanks, by the obsolete way of following the written code, so that, say so that, yes, we may now serve God by living, hallelujah, we may serve God by living in the freshness of a new life, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, now we, ser- we used to serve God by, we are motivated to follow the law. Now we're motivated to live in love and power of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty amazing. Let's, let's look, you know, at the, in the context for these folk, um, this was really big news for them. <laughs> that the law was passing away was not like it is for us today. For us, it's like, whew, I'm really glad I wouldn't be able to do that. For them, this was revolutionary. It's, it's as if someone came to the shores of America and said, the Declaration of Independence has passed away. You would be like, we're going to kill you. That's what we would do. You are now a terrorist. But um, anyway, <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so this is super revolutionary for them and their culture. Uh, the law was, was not just foundational to their tradition and their security in their culture. It was divine. So do you guys remember how the law came to the Israelites? On a glowing mountain that was on fire with trumpets and lightning. And the man who got it came down with a glory glowing and emanating off of his beam. So much so that he had to cover it so people weren't terrified. So the law came from God in a supernatural encounter with Moses. It wasn't just, it it was a divine, sacred revelation. It was the most glory-filled, powerful, um, awesome, inspiring revelation of Yahweh until Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. God revealed himself in the law until Jesus. So it's not just like giving up the idea of the law. It It was sacred to them. It was god to them. It, it helps them have a relationship with God. Think about the amount of money alone made you, with the law. I don't mean in a bad sense. I mean, just like, look, think about the sacrifices, for example. All of the sacrifices that actually represented Jesus' sacrifice, someone had to buy those animals. Someone had to raise those animals. Someone had to sell those animals. Someone had to sell the servants that served the animals. Someone had to buy the food, Right? Someone, a child had to walk it to go get sacrificed or whatever. Like every, there was employment, there was economy, there was trade, there was money and wealth that the law actually created for these people. And then you you have the temple and all the identity and the culture and the pride that God lived in a building with the Israelites. (laughs) Like it wasn't just tradition to them. It was divine. Like because they followed the law, God dwelt in a building covered in gold and beauty. It took decades for them to make that one when Jesus was there. And it was the sacred place God lived on planet Earth. And the Israelites got to say, this is ours. Um, Think about all of the um, people coming to visit, all the tithes, all the taxes, all of the tourism, I don't even know if they had tourism in that day, right? But you come to visit the temple, like trade, commerce, economy is coming because God lives with the Israelites. And you, then you have the feasts, right? You know, when Pentecost happened, people were there for the feasts. So people were gathered in Israel. So what happens when people travel from all over the world to one city to party? <laughs> People spend money, right? People bring their goods and you give them your goods. You grow in influence. You grow in money. You guys get the point. It is an economy that the law provided for the people of Israel. It also gave them their entire culture. Who you can eat with, who you can't eat with, who your kids can hang out with, who your kids can't hang out with, who you can marry, who you can't marry. Where is safe to go? Where is not safe to go? What you can touch, what you can't touch. What makes you dirty? What makes you clean? Right? It provided safety, context. It provided banks to the rivers of life. 
and everywhere it went, there was success if you followed it. This is amazing. So Jesus is saying, yo, all of that's gone. <laughs> it would cause a revolt because you're saying, I'm not, who, how are we going to make money? You know how many hundreds of generations of my family has made money because of the temple, because of the feast? Be- you know, I make all the food for the feast or whatever, you know? This was revolutionary for these people. It wasn't just spiritual to them, and it didn't just change their personal life as an as a individual. It changed their identity as a nation. Isn't that amazing? It changed their foundation from which they built their entire nation. And Jesus says, and Paul is saying, this all passes away in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's, that wouldn't be very easy to do if you're Jesus. You're literally defunding Israel. <laughs> and you're saying, now everything that you found in those things, come and marry me and find them in me. They were thinking, you're going to come and establish us over the Romans. But Jesus was saying, all of this points to me, and I've fulfilled it. The feast point to me. The temple points to me. The laws have a purpose, and they were to reveal me. So we're going to get into that. Um, I'm probably just going to read what I just read. I don't think I'm going to read the rest of Romans 7 because I'm going to cover it. And it's just wordy, and it'll take a chunk of time. But I'm going to cover the content, okay? So um, we have to understand, in order to understand, you know, these sentences here, like, you died to your first husband, the law, so you are now free to marry another. Okay, so if... You, if you're going to marry another, you have to understand who the first one was that you died to, right? And we're long removed from that husband. It's been dead for like 2,000 years, right, in Christ. But these people were fresh in it. So what was the role of the law? Um, we need to understand that to know what we're dying to. So first of all, the law, the role is to expose and unmask sin in you. So, how many of you know when God speaks something, His Word is alive? It's living, and it's not just hovering over you. It's active. Say that. The Word of God is active. Say that. In me. So, when He says the law, He's not just saying, all right, y'all are so dumb, I need a a don't-do list for dummies. Don't murder. Don't. Don't sleep with your friend's wife. Don't cheat on your taxes. Y'all are dummies, and I just got to put a don't do list. Here's one through 10. So, what is the law then? It is a living, active word that goes forth, and it doesn't return to the Father until it's accomplished his purpose. The purpose is to expose sin in you. Because it says here in Galatians 3.23 that, that, the law made it so, sorry, this is Romans 7, 8, it's later in our chapter. The law made it so that our sin was no longer dormant. In Galatians three twenty three, it says that it is a jailer holding us until Christ came. So the, when, when God releases from his mouth, do not kill, it's a living active word that goes into you and puts a headlock. Just imagine Justin's arm up here. Maybe Justin could... This big bicep arm comes and puts a headlock around sin and pulls it up out of you, exposes it, and drags it into jail until Christ comes. That's literally what the law does. It's a living, breathing, active word that comes into your heart, pulls up sin, says that's sin. It's not just the fruit, right? Murder is the fruit of hate, anger rage. It's the fruit of a root. So the law comes up and exposes everything, and it puts it in jail until Christ comes to judge sin and death. And did you know that, and it says it later in this Romans 7, that you have an identity, and everyone but pre-Jesus has an identity, and do you know what that identity is? It's, it's, you know, this textbook's answer. Someone say, son, daughter, But then Paul says, I have an intruder. Do you know who the intruder is? (laughs) Sin. 
And he says, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I want to do. You guys know that? Inside of me, I have a God identity that wants to please God and wants to do the right thing. But he says, I perceive, right? So we have these two things, and the law, like a police officer, comes into your house and puts the intruder in handcuffs and drags him to jail until Christ the judge can come and judge sin. And the important distinction is he's judging sin. This is the role that the law plays. And if you never experienced a conviction of your sin or the law pulling it out, you'll miss your appointment with the judge. See, sin needs to be exposed so that it can be brought into the presence of the one who can forgive it. But if it remains dormant, then it remains empowered. Right? If it can remain dormant, it can remain present, and it can keep you in its prison. So thank God for the law. The law wasn't God striking out at trying to redeem humanity. It wasn't his failure of an effort. It was him speaking a word that would bring the intruder out of you and into his son. And this is why the the enemy is so bent on cloaking sin. Because if sin can remain dormant, it, it can remain in a person. And that person can never come to their, their appointment with judgment and be set free from sin by Christ. Right? He does these with godly character words. Have you ever noticed the devil never sells himself? He always sells God <laughs> and twists it. He doesn't invent anything. So God invents sex and the devil sells it outside of marriage. Right? You could go down the list of the different things. God invents pleasure, and the enemy wants you to get it through drugs and alcohol. He he twists God's character because he has no character. So what does he cover sin with? Just accept everyone the way they are, brother. Acceptance, love. Love is love as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Freedom. You're free to do whatever you want. Who am I to judge you? peace. I just want to keep the peace. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't, I don't want to make anyone feel judged. And, and the wake-up call is that when you actually accept someone and you're accepting them in the context of them embracing sin, you're accepting their intruder as their identity in ignorance. I'm in bondage to pornography. Well, that's okay as long as it's not hurting anybody. Well, That's a lie, number one. But number two, pornography, you're missing the point. The point isn't, am I hurting anybody? The point is, is that their actual identity? Or is that the intruder? If you're free to sin, you're not, and you sin, you're not actually free. You're a slave to sin. I'll say again, if you're free to sin and you sin, and you're in bondage to sin, you're no longer free. And it's actually not accepting someone for who they are. It's accepting someone for who the devil says they are. <laughs> it's accepting someone that, that, that you were created to be addicted to a substance. And if you want to spend your life binging on that substance because you haven't been filled with the love of Christ, I accept you that way. And I don't want to anger you by telling you that's not God's fullness for your life. <laughs> And we would rather let them reap the fruit of sin, which is death, than share the gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And the law comes to pull that up and say, no, that's not what you're made for. It's not, see, the enemy wants to say, if they tell you don't do that, they're telling you you're a bad person. That's the enemy. Jesus comes in and says, I never put that in you, son or daughter. He pulls it out and he says, I'm putting that in jail for my son to deal with. And the enemy tries to cover that sin with godly character so it remains concealed and and hidden so you never have to deal with it, ultimately so Jesus never has to deal with it. So he can remain Lord of your life, causing you to harm other people and harm yourself until you die. And sin also calluses your conscience. Sin calluses your conscience and sin removes your sensitivity by callousing your spirit. 
by building resistance to the conviction. And all of the good news of all of this is that there is something that God breathed into this world that is living, alive and active, that will pull that sin out of you. You don't have to pull it out of you. If you just say, pierce me, speak to me, I say yes. I say yes to your righteous words. If you say this is unholy, I will say, yes, come and pull it out of me and bring it to jail until Christ can come and judge the intruder in me. If you say this is what it looks like to live holy, come and judge unholiness in me. Because my true identity is I'm a son and I love to do what pleases you. Because that's who you say I am. That's truth. That's righteousness. And that's love. And it's not true love to let an intruder remain in your house and abuse your family and your friends. And that's what sin is. So that was good. Um, <laughs> so we see the purpose and the role of, of the law finds its fulfillment in Christ. It was sent out, it has gone out, and it is harvesting sin out of his children, and it's bringing it, and then Jesus shows up, and, and the law is like, hallelujah, the role for which I was sent. My purpose is fulfilled. The judge has come. He brings everyone's sin before the cross in a headlock, in handcuffs, like a police officer. And he says, Father, the purpose for which you have sent me has finally come. To this day, I bring your sin to the judgment of Christ. And Christ sits in that place and he says, the wages of this sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And he says, I'll take that sin. I'll take it, put me up on that cross right now. How many of you can imagine a scene of the most obscene things done in all of history? Hitler, Idi Amin, Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, Nathaniel Stubbs, <laughs> everyone else in this room, guilty as charged. And the judge says, guilty, you can think of all the bad sins, murder, rape, all this stuff. Guilty of lying, guilty of pride, guilty of, of self-sufficiency, guilty of of flesh, living in the flesh, guilty, guilty, guilty. And then he stands up and he hits his gavel down. He says, I'm taking all of this punishment, taking it all. And I'm declaring these sinners sons and saints of God. And he didn't make you a son that day. He confirmed what was true about you the whole time, that your identity is son and the intruder is sin. <laughs> he, he, he did make you a son that day. For every, I know that's in the, he did make you a son. But what he really did is none of you in this room came from anywhere except for Abba, Father. And he confirmed that. Yes, sin is in you, but he said, you are my son, and that's an intruder. I'm taking it all. I'll take all of it. And this is what verse 1 through 6 is all about. You died to the law, and you died to your sin in Christ. So Jesus harvests, the law fulfills the purpose, right? We just understood what's the role of the law. It brought all of the sin of humanity, past, present, future. Everybody's from the worst you can think of all the way to your little white lie. And he put it in the man Jesus. And Jesus descended into hell, death, and the grave. And he paid the sentence for every sin ever known to man. This is amazing. All of your sin passed away. Gonzo. Done with. Say that with me. It's gone. Passed away. In Christ, your sin is where? Gone. Passed away. It, he descended with all of the darkness of humanity into death, hell, and the grave and died. He didn't descend with all of his power and ability. He descended as the Son of God and the Son of Man, giving himself up to the Father, knowing that he would not let him see death and decay. He didn't say, I am so strong, I will not see it. Remember in Psalm 16, I believe it is? He said, the Father will not let me see decay. He gave himself to the Father, literally took your place. If not for Father, Jesus would still be in hell. If not for the spirit of power and resurrection life, Jesus would still be in hell as a human man. But the glory of God and the power of God 
resurrected Jesus Christ out of the realm of your sin and your death and out of the law. <laughs> Someone get happy about this. You, the law is fulfilled. It took your sin, it took your shame, it took everything that you are wrong for ever and put it in that man Jesus and he died, but he rose victorious over that. And the law and the sin passed away in Jesus Christ. This is where we pick up in verses four through six. Let's read through it a little bit together here. So my dear brothers and sisters, the same principle applies to your relationship with God, for you died to your first husband. The law, by being co-crucified with the body of the Messiah. So now you are free. Say that, free. Now you are free to marry another, the one who was raised from the dead, so that you may now bear spiritual fruit for God. Goes on to say, when, when we were merely living natural lives through defining sin, the law actually awakened sinful desires in us, which resulted in death. But now we have been fully released from the power of the law, and we are dead to what once controlled us. We are no longer motivated by what once controlled us, and we are now free, and it's so that we may serve God by living in the freshness of of a new life. <laughs> this is amazing. Like, this is what he's saying to the Hebrew when they're like, you just took away our whole economy. You took away our whole life, our whole livelihood. The law just passes away in you. And he says, yes, so that you may no longer be motivated by fear. So that you may no longer be motivated by checking off all the boxes and doing the right thing. So that you may no longer be motivated by fear of punishment or failure or being enough or not being enough. All of those things passed away so that you can marry me. And that's really the truth of it. That's actually really the reason for the law was so that God could cleanse you to be his bride. If he's perfect, he can't marry someone imperfect, right? So he had to become all of your imperfection and pay the true price as a just God, and then rise victorious so he could make you perfect, so he could marry you. This is good news. I love that it says that we serve God by living in a fresh life. We serve God by living in the power of the Holy Spirit. We serve God by being in love with him. That's how we serve him now. And I, I, this is going to be a little bit shock value. It's on purpose. But we overemphasize the, that on the cross when Jesus died, that it was all about us and our sin, which is kind of what I just did. I mean, it, it's absolutely true. But when you overemphasize it, what are, you, what are you left with? When you think about the cross and Jesus, do you think about your sin and what, and what he paid a price for? You should, of course. But if that's all that you emphasize, what are you left with? A dead husband. The law passed away. Your sin passed away. So if all the cross is representing to you is what passed away, you are an empty slate. You're cleaned. You're dead to sin and dead to the law. But this is why Paul says, so that you can marry another husband. Are you guys following? Let's take, let's take Israelites for a lesson. <laughs> cleaned from Egypt, delivered from death, set free from bondage and slavery to marry the promised land. But they spent 40 years in the wilderness. They spent 40 years in the sand. And the enemy loves clean spaces. It's true. You guys following me here? The enemy loves empty spaces. That's where he torments God's people. 
And see, the cross is not just about what he took away. If I take this water bottle away and I throw it in an incinerating fire, and then I put a million dollars on the, on the table, and all you want to do is talk about what I burnt up in the fire, you're missing the point. God took sin off the table and put his son on the table. God took the law off the table and put freedom on the table. So how is he operating in the earth now? It, these are incinerated in him. The law, it says, in, I think it's First Timothy, is for unbelievers. The law is for those who are stuck in sin so that the law can pull it out to Jesus still. <laughs> the law is still like, ah, oh, God, helping these people out that don't know that that's not actually what God meant for them. For believers, it's gone. And the cross is about marrying Jesus. It's about you being cleaned from your law, cleaned from your sin, and then marrying life. And the enemy would love nothing more. If you get delivered from his camp, like the Israelites, if you're delivered from Egypt, he wants nothing more than for you to remain a wilderness inside. You're delivered from death, delivered from fear, delivered from the law, delivered from punishment, but you've never married life. You've never married the land. You've never married the milk and honey. And Jesus says that if he casts out demons from you, but you're not filled, seven more come back to fill the house. Woo, I just hit spirit of religion. Because if your house is empty and you've been delivered from death and you, Pharaoh died and Jesus shed the firstborn son blood, right? That's all a metaphor. Pharaoh's firstborn son dies to deliver the people of God out of sin and death. And Jesus dies, right? And we get delivered into the wilderness, but we don't marry Jesus Christ who says, I am the life, then you are empty and a spirit stronger than the spirit of the world comes in. <laughs> because the spirit of the world breaks at the cross, but religion can still operate past the cross. And it fills you and makes you think you're doing something holy because the pillar's there, the fire's there, God's showing up in your meetings, God's doing something in your nation, God's doing something in your family, you're still operating in the power, but God intended for the milk and honey to get into you. God intended for you to become like him on the inside. You guys tracking? Right, the whole Egypt analogy? The enemy loves dry places. And this is why Paul says, you died to the law to marry Jesus. You died to sin to marry righteousness. You died and you were cleaned to be filled. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you one of the greatest agendas of the enemy is to attack the Spirit of God. Because if there's no anointing, you are wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And it's a this is also going to prick someone wrong, and I just don't have time to over-explain it, so just love me. If you have lived in a wilderness season, and you are not releasing a river, and you are not bearing fruit, the enemy is teaching you. <laughs> the wilderness has become your teacher. See, it says, they will, in the wilderness, there will be a river. It says, he will make your waste places like the Garden of Eden, says the Lord. He will bring water out of rocks. He will only bring you into the wilderness to reveal that he is the garden inside of you. And if you've been in the wilderness 5, 10, 12 years, I promise you Jesus did not come down out of heaven to die on a tree in the hot sun, to go to hell, to resurrect, to send you to the sand. He did not slay all the firstborn children in Egypt and rip his people out through plagues and trauma and craziness, take them through an ocean and say, all right, have fun, go party in the desert. He said, I have a land for you flowing with milk and honey where I will display through you that you are my children and that I am God and you will bring my kingdom to this earth and you will do it by serving me in the freshness of a new life and in the power of my Holy Spirit, the same way I demonstrated it when I came to earth. <laughs> Woo! That's a hand clap right there. Come on. And so some of us today are being delivered from the sand life. 
It's the same thing that happened. We were delivered from Pharaoh, which represents sin. We were delivered from Egypt, which represents our flesh. We were delivered into freedom. And Jesus is saying, will you marry me now? And we need to emphasize the cross is, is not a revelation about how powerful sin is, how evil humanity is. It's a revelation of how much his son loves you. He died to take away your sin, but more than that, he died to give you his life. And in order to give you his life, he had to take away your sin. It's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken. <laughs> Jesus came first for you. And so he had, it says for the sin set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, which is you and me. It was about him marrying you, and this is the way that we serve God as a freshness, this new creation life. All things have passed away, and we're, we're going to close here with this. That we're kind of closing with this. We'll see what the Holy Spirit does. Um, the law has passed away, so therefore, remember you guys, the law comes to what? Take sin up, put it in jail, and let Christ judge it. Christ says, I take it all. Finished. And not only that, I rise above it and I give you my life in its stead. So all you have to do to be free from sin is bring it to Jesus. And all you have to do to be full of life is receive Jesus. Okay? So the Holy Spirit no longer has an agenda to expose sin in you, but to expose Christ in you. Because in Christ, all sin passes away. I want to tell you, if you have been hearing and being exposed all this sin in you, but nothing, it, there's no grace for you to be forgiven, that's religion. If there is an exposure, if a leader is exposing sin in your life, if your family is exposing sin in your life, if someone's condemning you for sin in your life and not providing a way out of it, it's religion. See, the enemy to the unbeliever says there is no law because if there is, their sin is exposed. To the believer, he says there's only law because if, if the law is fulfilled, their sin is gone. Because the purpose of the law is to bring it into Christ. So he tries to bring you back under condemnation, under fear, under shame. And he tries to use the law over you. It's called religion. So that he can keep you under something that passed away. Your old husband named the law. And he can keep you in the wilderness, not married to the new, right? So he's trying to convince us to marry the land, to marry Jesus, flowing with milk and honey, He's trying to persuade you to be delivered from death to possess you with life. The enemy wants to keep you remembering what's behind you, the old things that have passed away. He wants to keep you in the sands of the wilderness, confused about your destiny, delivered from death, but not possessed by life. And this is what this chapter is all about. Paul is declaring the old has passed away so that you can come into the new. And so I want to I wanna, um, kind of end the conversation with this. Jesus today wants to marry you. <laughs> and if you're married to him, he wants to renew his vows. So no one's a passive listener. Not that any of you were doing that. He wants to marry you. And give you the fullness of his life. But some of you have a voice in your head that's saying, but remember. But remember where we came from? We were just slaves in Egypt. We were just under bondage. We are nobodies. Or he wants to keep you remembering the joys. At least you got a couple meals a day in Egypt. But following the promises of God is kind of hard. He, he constantly is trying to resurrect what Christ killed. And some of us, in order to marry the new, we need to remember the old has died. Some of us, in order to come into full abundant life, we need to, be, we need to fully die to what Christ died to. Right? Some of you, sin has been swirling around you of past things that you did. And it breaks today in Jesus' name. 
That cycle of sin consciousness is a lie. That sin passed away in Christ, and he rose over your sin, victorious. Some of you need to, to, and let's just stand up here. We're going to pray into this. Let's just stand up and the Holy, let the Holy Spirit just minister to us. Some of us, that, that sin has been so enslaving us. You need, to, you need to remember and realize and declare that that is not who I am. That is not who I am. And we give you permission, God, to come in and to, to judge my sin on your son to take it out of me and put it into your son. I am righteous. I am clean. I am holy. I am pure. And forget the former things. Forget it. If you need to go home and make a grave and have a tombstone (laughs) and write your sins out, write your failures out, write the old things that passed away and bury it and, and then Set it on fire and burn it. Because God is taking you into the milk and honey. God is taking you into the abundance. God wants to bring you into the fullness and the fat of his house. And it's through the marriage union that you have with his son. It's through being one with his son. It's through being one with his son. He wants to bring you into the good shepherd and they will go in and out and find pasture and be fully satisfied. And, and it says that Jesus Christ came to give eternal life and this is eternal life that they may know him, that they may know him. And, and eternal life is a fountain of life inside of you. It says in John that the life, uh, the light The light of life was in him, and he is the light of man. When his life comes into you, you come alive, (laughs) and you are full of light, and his life is light. His life is honey. His life is milk. His life is abundance. And for some of you, the father in his in his strength and in his wrath is saying, I am tired of you being in the sand. I am tired of you tolerating, uh, or he's saying, I'm not tolerating desert seasons in you anymore. I want you to marry the land, son. I want you to marry the promises, daughter. I want you to let the old pass away and give yourself completely to the new, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Marry Jesus today. Give him everything today. Hold nothing back today. Let the law and sin pass away. Come into and serve God by living in a fresh new life, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we just make space for you to come and touch us this morning with your love and your power and your freshness of life. Peter said in Pentecost, he said, they asked him, what must we do? And he said, repent, be baptized, that times of refreshing in the Holy Spirit may come. Times of refreshing in the Holy Spirit. Just put your hand on your neighbor next to you and say, refreshing. Refreshing. Times of refreshing. Times of infilling come. Come, if, if you have dead spaces, we're going to just do like five, ten minutes here. If you have dead spaces and, and you're like, man, this place has been fruitless in my life. It's been dead in my life. I'm delivered from sin, but I'm not possessed by life here. I want you to be really brave, and we've all been there and probably all are there in a measure. Put your hand in the air. You're saying, I want life. I need life. The enemy has kept me in the sand here. And you know what? It's time that he buffets me no longer. It's time that I step into my promises. Put your hand in the air. And again, corporate ministry, if you're around them, keep your hand in the air until someone's touching you. And just take this time seriously, guys, and pray. Begin to speak fresh life over you in the name of Jesus. 
If there is something that has chained you up that you cannot get out of, put your hand in the air because that is absolutely dealt with in the name of Jesus. And we're going to minister in the power of that name that breaks every chain. Begin to just speak that over them. Begin to speak right now. We declare the name of Jesus is above every name in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. And we speak today, you are destined for promises. You are destined for the land flowing with milk and honey. You are destined for eternal life, abundance, and all of the old has passed away. I just speak in this room, the shalom of Father right now, absolutely silencing darkness and just releasing the light of Jesus, shedding into every heart. I speak freedom over your finances, freedom over your nightlife, freedom over your children. Just begin to declare over those people, pray over them. Begin to just bless them, begin to speak whatever Holy Spirit gives you. Thank you, Father. We just declare that your sin, your sickness, and your lack, your poverty, your sand, <laughs> your lack of life passed away in Christ. And we declare that the Holy Spirit is resurrecting those areas. We declare the Holy Spirit has a new thing he is doing. He has a new thing he is doing in Jesus' name. <clears throat> I do, I'm going to say it one, one last time, and I mean it. <laughs> one last time, though. Uh, if you really want to be free from something today, like I feel freedom in the room. If you want to be free from something, put your hand up. Um, if you didn't the first time, that's fine. Put your hand up. If you want to be delivered, if you want to be delivered, if you want to be free, put your hand up, and we're going to pray one more round, okay, guys, and then I'm going to dismiss you. I just want to honor what the Holy Spirit's doing in the room. Thank you, Lord. Yep, we just thank you for freedom, Holy Spirit. All you have to do to be free is just let go and die in him and raise up in him. Thank you, Lord. Does anyone have a word that's burning on their heart? Burning, any, any word or prayer that you feel is burning on your heart right now? <clears throat> no problem if not. I just wanted to check. Yeah, Denny kind of does. Papa D. Well, I've actually been thinking about this for a few months that I think in the Western world, we have not really fully preached the gospel. That we have mostly centered in on come to Jesus, receive Jesus, and receive the forgiveness of sins and you'll go to heaven. And and the problem with that is that it's like leading a, a horse to water and then not letting him drink. You see that? I mean, it's like we've only led him so far, and then it's like, okay, now the result is so beautifully said. You know, a desert life, a sand life, living out there in the wilderness instead of in the promised land. And really, the, the, other, the, the rest of preaching the gospel is, Jesus will not only forgive your sins and set you free from sin, but he will empower you to live a life you never knew existed until you met him. You never even knew it existed until you met him. It's like the narrow way. You went through the eye of the needle, and the eye of the needle was so narrow, I had to go through Jesus to get through the eye of the needle. But when I got on the other side, it was like the whole universe was available to me. And I didn't even know it existed. That's the gospel we need to preach. Not just come to Jesus, get your sins forgiven, and go to heaven. But come to Jesus, get free, and live a life you never knew even existed. But it is so abundant and full of love and power and spiritual gas that gets your vehicle going all day long every day for the rest of your life. That's the person that you're meeting and giving your life to, not just somebody who's like, 
Well, you're forgiven now. Struggle through the rest of your life until you go to heaven. No, 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 no. So anyway, that was burning in me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like being living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Is it, that is so good, Denny. All right. Wow. Yeah, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with this new life this morning. Father, we thank you for everything that you did this morning. And we thank you for the good news that you came not just to take away our death, but to give us your life. So we receive you this morning with joy. And we're going to serve you by living in a fresh new life in the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, prayer team, if you can come up. And uh, if you guys need a miracle, if you want a prophetic word, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, come up to the front.